Good morning, all. As we enter into this virtual service, please note you will be muted by our host. If you wish to speak during the announcements and or joys and concerns, please go to the participants icon, click on the raise hand button, a blue hand will appear by your name. When I call on you, you can then hit the unmute me button and speak. Click on lower hand button and the mute me button when you are finished. Remember, do not unmute yourself until I call on you. Thank you. Also, if you are not already a spe in speaker view, seeing only me next to the slideshow, then click on the speaker view button. In fact, I will do that. Point right there. A speaker view button near the upper right part of your screen. Now near the top center, find the click on the button called view options. You should get a short pull down menu. At the bottom of the pull down menu is an option called side by side mode. Click on that then adjust the proportion of the slideshow and me as you wish. We recommend the slideshow two thirds of your screen. Remember, you are in control of the size of both the speaker and the slideshow images. We must practice, although I'm wondering why I see Diane in the pictures here, but okay. <laughs> We must practice social, oh, I'm sorry. Randy was going to ring the bell. Thank you. Our opening words today, we must practice social distancing and stay at home for a while because that's the only way to stop the coronavirus from spreading. However, we must also keep in mind that not everybody is in the position to work from home, nor do they have enough savings to make ends meet without work for even a few days. So now, more than ever, is the time that we wake up the human in us and come to the rescue of those in need by either helping such individuals in our locality personally or by donating to the, a COVID-19 relief fund. We must make sure that we all have each other's back and that we all get through this catastrophe together without leaving anyone behind. At times our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lit the flame within us and the community. Our opening hymn today, but before we start the hymn, let me remind you to leave yourselves muted. This technology does not sync everyone precisely when speaking or singing together. <laughs> and you might end up just hearing me, but we know it does not feel the same as when we are together. But we want you and whoever is with you to sing with Jan as big and loud as you like. Make it a joyous experience. So let's sing the opening hymn, We Gather Together, number 349. Yeah. 
Thank you, Jan. Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist community of Cambria. We're glad you've joined us today. As a Unitarian Universalist community, we celebrate religious diversity and welcome all who journey in search of faith and spirituality. The UUCC is a lay-led congregation inviting speakers from different religious traditions and spiritual or scientific backgrounds to speak in our pulpit. We encourage presentations covering a variety of topics and areas of interest to our community that connect with the UU Seven Principles. In fact, today's service centers around two principles. The first principle, we affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Reverence and respect for human nature is at the core of the Unitarian Universalist faith. We believe that all the dimensions of our being carry the potential to do good. We celebrate the gifts of being human, our intelligence and capacity for observation and reason, our senses and ability to appreciate beauty, our creativity, our feelings and emotions. We cherish our bodies as well as our souls. We can use our gifts to offer love, to work for justice, to heal injury, to create pleasure for ourselves and others. And the second principle today we'll address. We affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Compassion is something that we can easily act on individually. We can demonstrate openness, give people respect, and treat people with kindness on our own. But we need one another to achieve equity and justice. It points us to the larger community. It, prom it promotes collective responsibility. It reminds us that treating people as human beings is not simply something we do one-on-one, -on -one, but something that has systemic implications and can inform the, our entire cultural way of being. My name is Dolores Miera, and I am your worship associate this morning would like to extend a special welcome to today's guests and visitors. We're glad you joined us this morning under these challenging circumstances. If you are not on our mailing list, please visit our website at uucambria.org UUC so that we can keep you informed about all of our activities. Also, the membership committee invites non-members to consider becoming a member of our com community. Please contact Janet Cooper. You wanna raise your hand, Janet? There you go, okay, can you see Janet? Or a board member, all the board members can raise their hands if you are interested. There you go, okay, thank you. So again, good morning and welcome to everyone. So now let's sing the affirmation. Thank you, Jan, again. I noticed I wasn't muted, and so I refrained from singing. We set aside this time for any short announcements that would be of interest to our UU community members and friends. Please keep your items short and to the point. For any items that need more explanation, please call or email the person after the service to be respectful of everyone's time. If you have an announcement, Please raise your hand by clicking on the raise hand button near the lower right of your participant window. When I call on your name, click the unmute me button near the lower left of the participants window, then speak. I'll call on Andy first. Uh, thanks, Dolores. Um, 
This announcement is regarding the small group discussions uh, on last week's topic, a lay-led congregation is something missing. Later today, I'll be sending out invitations to folks uh, based on the doodle poll times you said you would be available to participate. I realize some of us were uncomfortable with that doodle poll website. I'll send a follow-up email to those who have not signed up via the doodle poll asking if you would like to participate as well and then find a time that works for you. I look forward to speaking with as many members as possible over the next two weeks. Thanks, Andy. And Lou. Tomorrow, the men's group meets by Zoom and everybody should have gotten an invitation from Andy. Okay, thank you, Lou. Anyone else with a message? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And um, we do have a few Zoom meetings this week. And I hope everyone's getting um, adjusted to these because I think we might be doing them for a while. <laughs> okay. Uh, next week, Randy Schwalbe presents Hello and Goodbye, the first and last time for everything. These are the time for joys and concerns, sharing together some of our personal and significant joys and concerns brings us closer as a faith community. The collective flames of these candles also embody all the joys and sorrows which may have gone unspoken today, but are also deeply felt in this community. Our first reading today is by the Reverend Mary Catherine Morn, excerpts, excerpts from the letter. The World Health Organization, WHO, World Health Day has for 70 years sought to raise awareness of public health globally. Today, we have a deeper understanding of the impact of global health crisis on us all. And though any of us may become sick, any of us may die as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Very little else is equal. The UUSC is privileged to work with partners who understand this all too well. We partner with grassroots organizations after a disaster knowing they represent communities already impacted by injustice, communities likely to become even more disadvantaged by a crisis. Communities we know are more likely to succumb to disaster and tragedy because of the challenges they experience. It is beginning to be widely understood that disparities between the privileged and the oppressed are magnified during a disaster. The thousands of deaths caused by COVID-19 and the nuances in national responses to the pandemic illustrate glaring instances of the haves and the have-nots. Our health is inextricably linked to our circumstances. For those of us who are healthy, living through this pandemic is a critical time to consider worldwide health crisis we are facing. COVID-19 brings a crisp and sobering lens to the underlying crisis that characterized the lives of millions. The components have been here for so very long. Rampant economic inequality, valuing profit over people, disaster capitalism, transforming healthcare into business opportunities rather than a human right racism and ethnic hatred, white supremacy, rabid nationalism, and governing for profit. They say COVID-19 is an equalizer, that it is certainly true that any of us can fall ill to the virus. The long-term effects, however, for those of us who survive will not be equal. We know this to be true about disasters. 
Almost always, inequality is made much worse by a crisis in practice and sadly, often by design. As we move beyond this global catastrophe, and we will move forward, we commit ourselves to change. We commit to living in alignment with things we understand today more than ever. We are all connected. What affects one affects all. Every human life is precious. Though we share the same ultimate fate, our day-to-day -day choices drastically affect the days we are given. We can build a fairer and more just world. As we rebuild and pick up the pieces after this pandemic, let us use the tragedy of the lives lost and the injustices laid bare as much needed inspiration to advocate for global transformation. Let us join in a time of meditation, of prayer, and of silence. Let us seek the quiet and the calm, laying aside our struggles. And in the silence, may there be a reverence in our hearts, a thankfulness within our spirit, and a deepened understanding of the meaning of our lives. Let us enter the stillness. Please come back now. Chris will now share our second reading. The second reading today is from Fact Sheet, Coronavirus and SNAP, from the website Bread for the World. <clears throat> SNAP is designed to respond to changes in need, making it well-suited to respond to crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program is the first line of defense against hunger for people in the United States. SNAP benefits help low-income people put food on the table. Participants include seniors, children, people living with disabilities, and low-wage workers and their families. Nearly half of the people who receive SNAP are children. A very important feature of SNAP is that it is designed to respond to changes in need, making it very well suited to respond to crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic. The Family First Coronavirus Relief Act includes response waivers, exceptions to SNAP rules during the pandemic and post-pandemic period. For example, the legislation allows, first, SNAP flexibility for low-income jobless workers. It suspends work and work training requirements for SNAP during this crisis. Second, SNAP flexibilities in a public health emergency. It allows states to request special waivers from the Secretary of Agriculture 
to provide temporary emergency coronavirus SNAP benefits to existing SNAP households up to the maximum monthly allotment. And it gives the Secretary broad discretion to provide much more flexibility for states in managing SNAP caseloads. Over and above these necessary steps, Bread for the World calls for the following to support the most vulnerable people. First, <clears throat> to increase the maximum monthly SNAP benefit by 15%. Second, to temporarily increase the minimum SNAP benefit from $16 to $30 to encourage higher rates of senior participation. Third, to give states temporary flexibility to suspend SNAP administrative rules that weaken their response to the crisis. The COVID-19 economic recovery package must build on the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act and include the 15% boost in benefits to ensure families have access to adequate resources during the pandemic. Thank you, Chris. The anthem today, he ain't heavy, he's my brother by Bob Russell and Bobby Scott will be sung by our own Jan Colner.
Thank you, Jan. Beautiful. Today's talk is titled Social Justice During the 2020 Pandemic and will be presented by Christine Fox. Chris Fox has been a member of this congregation since July 2015. She has served on various church committees and in the Cambria and San Simeon communities on food security issues. She is happily married to the love of her life, John Rohrbach. A native Wisconsinite, she counts Massachusetts, Switzerland, and now California as her second homes. Please welcome Chris Fox. Good morning. When I was a young girl, we had a Mexican family move into our neighborhood. This was a bit unusual at the time. I, didn't, I don't think I knew any other Mexican families. I certainly had no Mexican classmates. In fact, our all white, very conservative town had no people of color living within its confines. But during the 60s, the Green Giant processing plant in a neighboring town began to hire immigrant labor to help during the harvest. And we began to see more people, so unlike ourselves, moving to our town a good place to find jobs in manufacturing when harvest season ended. One day, Maria, the child closest to me in, in age, asked me if she could come to our house for dinner. She was hungry, she said, and her family had no food at home. This family had at least four children, as I recall. Of course, my family fed her that evening and even with our limited resources, got some food to her family. My father recounted this story to me recently. I had completely forgotten Maria and her family and the circumstances that brought her into our lives. I bring up this story because of the challenge we have before us to deal with the global pandem pandemic and all that this entails for every aspect of our lives. More than ever, it is imperative to look beyond ourselves. The need for compassion towards people who came here under difficult circumstances and to recognize the sacrifices they make for their children's futures is not only relevant, but urgent. The pandemic has made striving for a foothold here in the United States even more difficult for, for many immigrant families. Low income families are experiencing the slide from insufficient wages to almost certain poverty. In the April 26th issue of The Guardian, Robert Reich, Secretary of Labor under President Bill Clinton, describes how the COVID-19 pandemic shines a light on a new kind of class divide and its inequalities. He describes the three groups that are not getting what they need to survive the crisis. He calls the first group the essentials, who include healthcare workers, farm and food producers, home care and child workers, truck drivers and transit workers, sanitation workers, drugstore employees, and police officers, firefighters, and the military. He cites the lack of adequate protective gear, paid sick leave, health insurance, and child care. He suggests that these workers deserve hazard pay, and of course they do. Reich names the next group, the unpaid, workers who have been furloughed or who have used up their paid leave. Many have lost their health insurance. Workers employed in personal service, such as in retail, restaurant, and hospitality work have jobs that cannot be done remotely. The unpaid most need cash to feed their families and pay rent, and few have the emergency funds to cover three months of expenses, a modest suggestion of the length of time when the earliest isolation orders were given to when the last state will be fully up and running again. Reich, Reich posits that given the choice between feeding their families and endangering their health, many will take the latter. Reich describes the last group as the forgotten. This is the group for whom social distancing is nearly impossible. It includes prisoners, the undocumented in our communities, 
and those who are in jails awaiting decisions on their immigration status. It includes migrant workers living in crowded camps, the very people who help to supply our food. It includes Native American reservations, homeless shelters, and nursing homes. Underrepresented in Washington and in state capitals, these groups do not have the luxury of adequate testing and health care, or even places to isolate if they become infected. Reich notes that the essentials, the unpaid and the forgotten are disproportionately black, poor, Latino, and they are disproportionately becoming infected. I have chosen to focus on food security because of the need to help supply food in our own community. The Hispanic population has suffered the loss of jobs and livelihoods to a much greater extent than the rest of the community. Many families, because of their uncertain immigration status, are not eligible for government assistance. Some do not have adequate health care. And yet, this population keeps our town running by supplying many needed services. They are our backbone. When they suffer, so do we. In Cambria and San Simeon, individuals, businesses, and nonprofit organizations have stepped in to help provide these families with food. Since the first week of major layoffs in service industries, the group I am working with, a collaboration of individuals and a local service club, have been delivering food to, to over 70 families in Cambria and San Simeon. Because of the generosity of the community, we have recently added gift certificates for non-food necessities and increased the amount of food we can bring to each family. Many of you have generously contributed. Thank you. We now have enough financial support to continue to feed families through May and into June, and we may start delivering weekly soon. As one good deed inspires others, more individuals and organizations in our community are reaching out as well through supplying families with, with, with restaurant meals and hot food. Our school district is distributing grab and go meals for students' breakfasts and lunches as are many school districts across the country. Fortunately for California families, on April 29th, Governor Newsom unveiled over 3 million in new funding to expand the state's farm to family program, a program that partners with 41 food banks serving all 58 counties. The governor also highlighted critical expansion of CalFresh and EBT programs to combat to combat food insecurity for low-income Californians, including a new pandemic EBT program for children who receive free or reduced lunch and EBT for online purchasing. Putting food on the table during this pandemic is hard for families on the brink, said Governor Newsom. It's in that spirit that we're expanding our farm to family program while also working to connect low-income families with vital resources and financial support. We thank our farmers for stepping up to donate fresh, fresh produce to our food banks. And we want families struggling to access food to know we have your backs. As Unitarian Universalists, we are inspired by the world's major religions and by sacred teachings of all faiths. From these teachings, we take our cues about how to address poverty. The Old Testament points to a moral obligation to alleviate some of the causes of poverty, oppression, exploitation, and misfortune. In Deuteronomy, we read that the poor will always be with us and to not withhold our help or to harden our hearts against them. In the New Testament, most notably the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, cite several examples of Jesus ministering to the poor and his exhortations to his followers to not forget them. Paul urges early Christians to be generous and to do good deeds, good deeds, <laughs> and to do them carefully. As for our Muslim friends and neighbors, the holy month of Ramadan has just begun, a time when Muslims are called to be thankful for blessings while also remembering the plight of the hungry and needy by fasting from sunrise to sunset. In addition, the humanist perspective 
deeply imbues our understanding of the effects of poverty oops, with the broader issue of human development, of people, fr of people being free to live a life they value. Whatever our religious or humanitarian views, values are, as Unitarians, we are called to reach out to others to help. We must look at the world as it is. The ideal of promoting social justice can become a reality only when we do the little bit more that hurts, whether it is keeping our house cleaners and landscapers employed when they cannot come to work, or not turning away when we see someone standing on the street corner asking for food or for work so they can feed their families. This builds a foundation of compassion in our society that reflects how we are in many ways responsible to each other. Food security and the poverty and financial instability from which it arises should not be a political issue, but a humanitarian one in which we deflect false dichotomies about who is worthy and who is not, of who should be helped or how. Sadly, this has become the norm in a political system in which everyone anxiously guards their own little slice of the pie. To underscore a difference in thinking, the UUSC's mission states that UUs are guided by the belief that all people have inherent worth and dignity. The UUSC advances human rights globally by partner partnering with affected communities who are confronting justice mobilizing to challenge oppress oppressive systems and inspiring and sustaining spiritually grounded activism for justice. Our acts that promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations have deep meaning in our current age. My family never had much in the way of material goods or financial security. My parents' ability to model giving, even when it hurt, is a lesson that has come back to me over and again in my adult life. As an adult, my own search for meaning eventually led me to become a Unitarian Universalist. As Unitarian Universalist individuals, we are presented with choices that challenge our personal status quo. As a universal, Unitarian Universalist congregation, we understand that social justice is not a cause. It is how we position ourselves in our community, in our world. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Normally at this time, we receive offerings from our congregants. However, due to the viral a virtual format of the service, we invite you to make your offering in one of the methods shown on the slideshow. Enlarge the slideshow tile to see how to do this. These methods will also be posted in the newsletter and on the UUCC website itself. Please make note of this and please make the effort to send an, send an offering. Thank you. Our thanks for any gifts given and received for the work of this community. Let us now sing the doxology.
please join in singing the closing hymn, Let Freedom Both East and West, number 148. Let us now recite the valediction. The flames of the chalice and these candles will no longer burn today, but the light of the flame within our hearts continues to shine brightly, illuminating the love felt in our community. <laughs> 